We're talking with Cheap Trick. On the left, John Brandt. In the middle, Rick Nielsen. And on the right, Robin Zander. But where's Bunny Carlos? Bunny, please get well. Bunny, last night, cooked his own food, got sick. He'd never done it before. So he's going back to his regular cheeseburger haunch and uh, munch down on the things he should. But uh, Bunny, get well. We'll see you on tour. Ah, oh, that was sweet. We would all like to know what your origins are, where you're from, how and where you met, and how long you've been together. Want to do it one at a time? <laughs> John, we'll start with you. Uh, let's see. Cheap Truck's been together since 1973. Has a very good year for uh, wine and the champagne, actually. Uh, 73, yeah. We started playing clubs all over Chicago and places like that. And at that time, it was Tom Peterson, Bunny Carlos, Robin Zander, and me. And uh, we've evolved from through the, the years. From the Homo sapiens species of uh, somewhere around uh, 2000. B.C. or something like that, I think. No, not those aren't. Oh. <laughs> oh. How long have we been together? Seven years? No, no. Eight we've been years? together since uh, nine years. Nine, nine years. years this year. And uh, we put our first record out in 1977, recorded in 76, and uh, we have our seventh album out right now. It's called One on One. And our latest addition to this combo is Mr. John Brandt. And he's over on my right and on your left. How do you work when you're writing? Do all four of you work together? Do you pair off? Do you have any special method? I think the method we use is we all pencil write... Pencil and paper. Uh, <laughs> pencil and paper, and we all write individually. And then we get together, and then we put it together. And uh, I bring my ideas to Robin, he brings his ideas to me, and we piece them together, and uh, somehow we end up with songs. Uh, like on our latest record. Oh, uh, oh. Excuse me. Oh, I'm listening for this. There, because we, we took your picture. We're waiting for that. To, uh, the latest record, we did 35 songs. We wrote, yeah, wrote about 35 songs and then cut it down to 11 for the album for one-on-one. -on -one. And when we originally went into the studio, we only had 12 songs. And so we wrote most of them in the studio. And out of those original 12, we only used three or four, I think, that are on the record. And so it meant we did a lot of writing in the studio. As well as being popular, your sound has a very strong music line. When did you decide to be serious musicians instead of <laughs> just loud, flashy pizzazz? Is that, is that what we were before? Is that what you're saying? No, oh. I'm saying as opposed to. I think we're still deciding that. <laughs> we haven't made the final commitment. I think rock music should be fun, and uh, I think we're, we definitely try to do, have as much of that as possible. We like to tour a lot, and uh, as far as being professional musicians, it sounds uh, sounds like a violin player with a New York uh, orchestra. I think we're we're serious about what we do, but at the same time, uh, it's the best job in the world. I think because we do what we like. That was another one of my questions, and I guess you answered it. The question oh. was, is it all still fun? Or are you getting tired of it? It's not all fun. No, it's a lot of hard work. And say like uh, we have a tour that will last anywhere from three to five to seven and our actually our longest tour was 18 months in a row so it's, it's a lot of work but uh, each night getting a reaction from a nice audience like you makes it uh, very worthwhile and it's a lot of fun speaking of touring and audiences you guys have broken all records in japan what we want to know is what's the difference between japanese and american audiences is there a difference it's more japanese in the audience in where in Japan. Oh, and that's it? That's outside, about it. Of, outside of San Francisco, yeah. yeah. I say, just, you know, rock music is like a universal language. Uh, in Japan, kids take English in school so they can speak it. And, but rock and roll music is like uh, English in France is popular, English in Russia, China, because uh, most of the, uh, the rock music of today and of the past is with the English spoken word. It makes it good for us because I can only speak Ekenspreken Deutsch. And who wants to make German records? Think. The German. Well, Udo Hindenburg, Udo um. Jurgens, and all these guys. And Heino. Heino. Oh, he's a real talent. I'm sure that our viewers would just love to hear a really interesting road story. Well, I have a paternity suit going right now. 
I was attacked by 14 girls in Wichita, Kansas. And they took advantage of me. They whipped me. They hurt me. They abused me. I loved it. But you got pregnant. Oops. Well, the baby was born and was holding the IUD. Have you ever heard that story? That's true. The most outrageous present for Robin came. It was a, a year ago Christmas, and a UPS package showed up at the door. <laughs> Out jumped this stinky girl. She'd been in there for six days. <laughs> Are you serious? Uh, serious. I don't know. Uh, it was from Seattle. She came from Seattle and showed up at her offices in Wisconsin. And she was naked, and she had a canteen and a couple sandwiches, and she was really funky smelling. Sent herself to Robin. I mean, how expensive is that to go UPS? And it was blue label, too, and it was awful slow. I guess it was the Christmas rush. And depended but on But it was much. COD, too, so it was, <laughs> it was even worse. Yeah. I had to pay the postman. Huh? You could have refused it. I wanted to, but she was kind of good looking. <laughs> Which came first? Did the audience you play to influence your songs, or did you get your audience because of what you said? No, we wrote songs before we had an audience. We used to play clubs and play schools and things like that. And I remember we played once out in Minot, North Dakota, and we had three people there. It was one guy was an Indian, of Indian origin, and there were, uh, one was the bartender, bartendress, big, big fat lady. She, and she was the one with the decibel meter. Yeah, she used to carry a desk when you tell us to turn it down. She had threatened, or she said we killed her dog, too, right. trying to not pay us. And then the third person was the guy that was hitting this Indian with a pool cue. <laughs> and that's a true story. True. And that was in Minot, North Dakota. And so our music came before our audience. <laughs> we came before our audience. But when they come to see us. Who's been your strongest influence? That girl with the, had the Limburger. <laughs> Stink on her. Ooh, musically, UPS girl. musically. Oh, music. Yeah. Well, you have to make it a little clear, you know. We're, Who's we're, been your strongest influence musically? Probably different people for every one of us here. Yeah. Okay, let's try one at a time. Who do you want to start with? You. How about me? Okay, musically, uh, because I grew up, and I'm still growing up, my parents were opera singers, and I used to hear a lot of loud opera singers and operettas and sacred and secular music in my house and at concerts. But they didn't influence me musically. Lost me as far as being around music. Musically, I like always like listening to radio, and I still like listening to radio. Good stations, you know, the stuff that plays a lot of new stuff and plays a lot of our stuff. Any one particular person more than anybody else? Mm. I always liked Roy Orbison a long time ago. Bruce Chanel. Orlans. They all had low voices and like that. How about you, Robin? Well, I guess um, my father probably influenced me because he was also a musician. He played organ and uh, he played keyboards, piano, and all that. Uh, and radio, again, between the time of like 1959 and 65, I guess. Uh, 59 because my sister had a record player and I used to go in and take her records when she wasn't around and play them on her player, scratch the crap out of them, you know. But I, she had like Elvis, all Elvis's records and she was listening to like Eddie Cochran and uh, she was you know, cool. Sam Cooke and she had a bunch of cool stuff. Twisting and I don't know, stuff like that. Then of course the Beatles, the Kings and the Who and the Stones and and all that music that everybody was influenced by at that time. Yeah, we, I don't think we ever had anybody, we're no different than anybody else. We, <laughs> we heard the same records you did, except instead of uh, you know, taking another sort of job, we just stuck with music. Yeah. John? No, I, just, I agree with that. It's pretty, the radio, there's so many bands, you know, you're influenced by everything you hear, you know. Do any of you have plans for any solo projects? Sure, we all do. Sure, we all have uh, plans for solo projects. Solo, I can't even say it. We all have plans for solo projects, uh, but not at this time. Cheap Tricks takes up most of our time because we tour 90% of the year and we record the rest of the time. We don't ever take vacations. 
this is a vacation to us to be able to sit here and talk to you and do a TV show or something like that. Well, this certainly has been a real treat for us. It really has? Yeah. I mean, you're sick of us already, so we yeah. have to go off camera. <laughs> I think, well, Let's go no. out and have a party. I think See, we like to go idea. party and have a good time. Yeah. yeah. With the yeah, cameraman and with the people here and all our fans. We <clears> See, <throat> if, if uh, Chief Hook was to disband tomorrow, we could all just be yeah. professional party people. I think that's the thing. We'll go to parties and uh, you can rent us for a small fee and all the beer we can drink. We'll show up at your house. Right. You know, it'd be sort of like stand around. Hi, tonight. We want to know something. What part, if any, do you want to play in the current video revolution? Uh, heavy question. What, was that? <laughs> what part do we want to play in the new video revolution? Current video revolution, yeah. Hmm, the video revolution? You see more into video than we're, in uh, we're a very visual band, so I think we can, uh, we can bridge the gap between music and video. Most bands, I feel, uh, it's like video killed the radio star. You know that tune? All right, I, yeah, I think it's, it's, it really has in many ways because most groups aren't visual enough, so they have to end up using animation. They have to use every gimmick to get their music across, where I think we just rely just on the groove, and I think that's that's the best video. Well, radio will always be around. It's, it's killed the crummy radio star. Yeah. Which is good for business, really. Good riddance to bad rubbish. Takes out all the crap. Not all the crap. We're still on. <laughs>